All right, we are in Exodus chapter number 12. We're going to read several verse, verses here. We're kind of picking up the second half of, uh, of this chapter. Uh, we looked at the first half uh, last time and uh, kind of the introduction for the 10th uh, the plague and, uh, and everything that's going on there. So um, let's drop down to verse number 21. Exodus 12, verse number 21. Uh, the Bible says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel, said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. And you shall take a, a, a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the, mor- at the, at the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and upon uh, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye shall be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep his, this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd give us, uh, give us wisdom, give us clarity of thought, give us uh, as, as we learn here. And uh, Lord, I know for many of us it's been, a, it's been a full and busy day already. And so Lord, I pray that you'd give us these next few moments, Lord, to um, just allow us to clear our, our hearts, our minds of everything except the study of your word. And uh, Lord, I pray that you just meet with us here in a very real, a very special way to, tonight. And uh, Lord, that you'd show us something from your word that would encourage our hearts, that would encourage us to, uh, to continue on and to just continue serving you, to loving you with all of our heart. And uh, Father, I just pray that um, you would show us something in our life that, that really just needs to change or teach us something uh, about you, some char- characteristic attribute of you. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would um, just bless each one for their... Uh, just for being here tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. This is, uh, so this, the, this is the actual Passover. Now, last week we looked at the kind of the introduction of this and, and, um, and, and kind of what it, what it meant a lot. And uh, so this thing that strikes me about this, uh, about the Passover, it's the same event, the exact same thing is going to happen for everyone in Egypt. It's all going to be the exact same. For some, it meant the death of the firstborn. But for some, it meant the salvation of the firstborn. And uh, and what the difference is, the only difference that mattered was the blood of the lamb on that door. That was the only thing that mattered. That's the only distinction that mattered. Um, so, keeping that in mind, it's the same. Uh, the same thing is going to take place in many people's lives. We all face different things, but in reality, there's not really anything new. <laughs> we face the same things, uh, but our response to it is often the. It's often what makes a difference. Uh, for us. So we, we look here at this Passover, this Passover thou being instituted, and so we look at these instructions that are being given. These are very detailed instructions, very specific instructions as far as what was to happen, the order that it was to take place, everything that needed to be done. Uh, in verse 21, uh, of course, last time we talked about the lamb, uh, they would select the lamb on the 10th day of the month, and they would keep that lamb until the 14th day of the month. 
and uh, and it was to, and it had the characteristics. It was to be unblemished, unspotted, all of those things. And then on this day, on this Passover day, the the lamb was to be slain, and uh, and God is going to, with all of these instructions, teach us something very very important. And this has been true since sin entered into the world. There can be no sacri- no salvation without a sacrifice. No salvation without a sacrifice. There have been... Uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about this. If you put yourself in their shoes, in that scenario, you're bringing a little lamb into your house for the better part of a week, getting to know it, so cute, so adorable, and then you're going to kill it. Imagine some of these young children had a problem. No, don't kill the lamb. But if there's no sacrifice, there's no salvation. And this we know is repeated over and over again for us in Scripture. Hebrews 9, verse 26, then must, uh, For then must he often have su- uh, suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end uh, of the world, he that hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10, 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ also, Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Romans 5, verse number 6, for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 1 Peter three eighteen. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Over and over again, we see reiterated for us throughout Scripture, Christ is our sacrifice. He is the once and for all sacrifice for sin, all sin of mankind. And uh, so what was the... Uh, what was the part of the sacrifice that God was looking for? He's looked, the blood. The blood of the lamb had to be applied. The blood of the lamb had to be applied. Hey, Mike, come on in, bud. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries, my friend. Um, the blood of the lamb was to be applied. And again, throughout Scripture... It is not enough that the blood simply exists. It's not enough that the lamb was slain. The blood had to be applied. And, uh, and so this we see that only through the shedding and the application of blood can there be salvation. Again, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood is no remission. Uh, Leviticus 17, verse 11, For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19, You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So it's not just that the lamb or, or that the lamb was slain. It's not just that the blood was spilled. It was the application must be made. And this is that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, faith in what God is telling us to do, faith in Him and Him alone. Without that, it's, it's of no value. It's, it's, there's just no use. Without that faith in the Lord Jesus, that is the application that we're looking at here uh, for, for, uh, for us. As they were... Um, I can imagine that there were at least some in Israel and in Egypt who on that night were thinking, are you sure this is going to work? Are you sure that killing the little lamb that we've been watching for four days now, you're sure this is going to work? You're positive. We are going to trust God. That's what Moses said, that God said, We're going to trust God. 
And at the moment that they did, they, they accomplished all of the things and, put, and applied that blood to the doorpost, to the, uh, the frame of the door, exercising faith in what God said. And uh, God having proven Himself to be true <laughs> over, the, over the better uh, course of a year with Pharaoh and uh, in this battle of the wills that we talked about Sunday night. And, uh, and so, so this is what he's looking for. He's looking for the blood. The blood uh, was applied on the outside. The blood applied on the outside is what satisfies God. That's the only thing that... Have you noticed that? I mean, I don't know if you've thought about this. It's the only thing that God was looking for was the blood applied on the outside. God did not enter the house and see if the occupants of the house were worthy. You have the blood. Done. He didn't go in and say, well, I don't know about this one, though. I don't know if you're worthy. I don't know if it... It was all about the blood. That is the only thing. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, that is all that God was looking for. And, uh, and certainly the same thing is true for us. The blood on the outside is what satisfies God. And as Jesus, our once and for all sacrifice was, was slain, His blood was spilled on that cross, that is all that God looks for for us. That blood on that cross of the Lord Jesus. You'll remember from last week, they had the instructions to eat the lamb, to cook it up and eat it, and, uh, and then burn up all the leftovers. And um, when, they were, when they ate the lamb, they were consuming, um, they were consuming that sacrifice, and uh, then they were satisfied. So as we feed upon the Lord Jesus Christ... We are satisfied in Him. Salvation is something that truly defies any human explanation or understanding. How is it possible that you are that you can know? This is what an unsaved person doesn't understand. How can you know that it's enough? How can you know that just faith in God is sufficient? How can you know for sure you're going to heaven? How can you just know? Listen, when you've partaken of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're satisfied. Jesus is enough. That's all that I can tell you. And until you get what I got, that's all that I can tell you. You know, that's all the proof that I can offer is just, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> that's it. That's all I've got. You have got to experience, you have to place your faith in Him. You have to feed on Him and, uh, in order to understand and to know that this is, uh, that, that's exactly what God says is true. And so, uh, in, also in verse 22, He, he tells them to use, um, to, to use the hyssop, which, which is kind of curious. They were to use a, um, a bunch of uh, of. Hyssop, that's, that's a bunch as in a, a hand, not a bunch like a whole lot, but, uh, but a bunch of hyssop. hyssop. That, uh, that hyssop came to symbolize uh, spiritual cleansing in Psalm 51. David, uh, David's psalm of repentance uh, asked God to cleanse him and use the hyssop uh, in his cleansing. And, uh, and in fact, hyssop is something that shows up... Um, really basically three times in Scripture. You see it in the Old Testament. Here in Exodus, you'll see it in Leviticus and Numbers, kind of in the same way to be used in this sacrifice. Um, but also, in Psalm 51, and uh, will you go see who that is that she's talking to there? I'm sure that's not somebody giving her a hard time in there. Um, don't expect anybody else to be here. Uh, okay. We all right? Okay. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, hyssop basically shows up three different times in Scripture. You see it in the Old Testament here, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, in the instructions for Passover, for the sacrifices being made. You see it in that Psalm 51 passage where, where it kind of represents that spiritual cleansing. The only other time it shows up in Scripture is at the crucifixion. They took hyssop, they put the, when they dipped the vinegar in the sponge, they put it on hyssop to get it up to where Jesus is. 
It's the only time hyssop is used or referenced in Scripture. And so, very uh, interesting um, usage of, uh, of, this, of this plant. The next thing there, um, they were not to go out until the morning. They weren't to use this passageway as a, they weren't to use this door then as a passageway, be running in and out all night. And that's probably why our parents yelled at us for running out the door all the time. Uh, anyway, uh, just kidding. That's probably not why. All right. This, the symbolism here, they were to go in, they were to make this sacrifice, go in until God was ready for them to come out. Symbolizing the sealing, they were sealed. And uh, for us, we have from our faith until our faith is realized in heaven, we have the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and the only protection between, between then and the exodus is the blood that's on the door. That was it. And, uh, so, and so that's kind of fun to, uh, to think about that as well. Uh, as we mentioned here, verse number 23 mentions that the Lord would pass over the place where the blood was applied. Not where the, um, not where the, not where the lamb was stayed if, this, if the sacrifice hadn't been made. But where the blood was applied. What's that? What does he want? Is he locked in? Is he okay? Well, just just see if he's okay. If he needs something, help him out. Oh, get him a get him a cup of water and see what he needs. All right. What's that? Sick mic on him. Well, they can hang out together. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. Is he okay? So you talk to him. He's just. I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Back on track here. The Lord's going to pass over the place where the blood is applied, where the faith has been demonstrated and acted upon. That's, uh, that's where we're at. Um, God told his people, remember this event. Verses 24 and 25, he tells them, this is going to be an observance. It's going to be something that you observe as an ordinance. Um, and this ordinance was to be kept by Israel. Every year, that you are going to remember this event. Um, and I think it's important. Some people, some people chide, you know, and scoff and, you know, you know, why do you do Christmas? Why do you do Easter or whatever? Um, God told them to remember the important things. And every year they were to observe this and they were to remember this. And I, th I think it's sad that by the time the first century church was established, they had turned these uh, the, the things like the Lord's Supper, which is the, the continuing observance of, this, of Jesus as our Passover lamb, um, had turned it into kind of a, 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 a feast, a, a barbecue, a block party barbecue, you know. Um, and, and that's not pleasing to God either. Um, so uh, he said, no, you're going to keep this ordinance. It's, it, is, it, it, it is a feast, but it was to be done a certain way. Then they were supposed to teach this, uh, this lesson to their children. Um, and, and honestly, I think that's where a lot of parents fail today is teaching, um, teaching these spiritual lessons. The message of Christ's sacrifice is to be taught in the home as well as in the church. So often we leave the, the instruction from Scripture, to we relegate that just to learning it at church. It's got to be taught, continued to be taught in the home as well. 
Um, it's, it, it, it is a problem if you're not continuing to teach these things, uh, continuing to teach these lessons uh, to your children day in, day out in their, uh, in their everyday life so that they can see God working and uh, so that they can see where God is, uh, what God has taught them as, as well. All right. Uh, verses 27 and 28, we saw the obedience of the people. They did what they were asked to do. They did what they were asked to do. And um, it, it is interesting. Putting away the unleavened bread. This is one of the, one of the things we talked about last in the first half of this chapter. Was they weren't supposed to have any leaven uh, there were no leaven during this during this period, but the putting away of the unleavened bread did not save them. But they did put away the leaven. They did only have the unleavened bread because they were saved. They put those things away because of what God was doing, because of what was taking place, and uh, so all sorts of application for all of these uh, for all of these things as well in uh, in the following verses we're going to kind of uh, just kind of work through this as we go here we see the infliction of the death upon the firstborn in verses 29 and 30 the Bible says it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, and there was not a house where there was not one dead. And uh, so without the substitute, the firstborn died. Without that substitute, the firstborn died. And so basically, as we've read through these last several chapters and God working them over and over and over again, now they take God seriously. Now they take God seriously. And we see this so often today, just the same. Where every day there's, there's occasion to remember God, to bring God into... Um, into our lives and remember Him, but instead we wait until it's something serious. We wait until someone's on their deathbed. We wait until we just we put off taking God seriously, and um, and of course with the wicked, it's the same is true. They um, they think they've got all the time in the world, even in the midst of a global pandemic. Well, we're just going to follow the science. I, I'm, I'm a little bit amazed and surprised, really, to be honest, that we didn't see uh, the the turn back to God um, in our country and in and throughout the world. Um, we're just we're just getting down to it. That's all there is to it, I think. Um, so just waiting, just waiting, just not not taking God seriously. Um, even though we see God doing all of these things over and over and over again, uh, we see Him working. Christ is the firstborn that died for us. Colossians 1, verses 14 and 15. Somebody find that for us. Colossians 1, verses 14 and 15. Read it for us nice and loud. <clears throat> Colossians 1, verses 14 and 15. Whom we have redemptive through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who took the image of the invisible God. Yep. Oh, my eyes, my eyes, my eyes. My oh your eye Bible. <laughs> your eye Bible died. Well, that's unfortunate. The firstborn of every creature. Christ is the firstborn that died for us and uh, made that sacrifice on our behalf, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Oh boy, when you put the Passover and Jesus together, you see uh, how everything fits, how all the pieces fit together. 
and uh, and it's just and it's just great. There's a the uh, verse number thirty talks about a great cry that rose in uh, in all of Egypt. There's a great cry in all of Egypt, and this is going to happen on Earth during this uh, during the time called the Great Tribulation. We read about it in, in uh, Revelation chapter six, verses twelve through seventeen. He says, I beheld when, the, when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken with a mighty wind. Heaven departed as a scroll when it's uh, rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their place. The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, chief captains, mighty men, Every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the, fr- on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Oh yes, oh yes, they know exactly. Uh, and I imagine that, that night when Pharaoh woke up and his boy was dead... He understood, and he understood one day too late. Save me from God. His, yeah, absolutely. His own gods couldn't help him over and over again. We saw that. And, uh, and we see it one day, one day too late. So a great cry rose up in all of Egypt. But again, what is the death for some is salvation for others. But those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus, those who have done exactly as God has commanded with this Passover, and uh, those who are exercising this faith in what God's told them to do, they're delivered. And uh, we see this deliverance of Israel here in the following, uh, in the following verses. Verse 31, and uh, he says, He called for Moses. This, this is Pharaoh. Pharaoh got up. He discovered that his firstborn has died. And uh, he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel. Go serve the Lord as ye have said. Take your flocks, your herds, as you have said, be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon, the sh- upon their shoulders. The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed the Egy- of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. And the children of Israel sojourned from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. Oh, Pharaoh has a change of heart, doesn't he? If this, was, if this was like the first nine plagues, we would have read in this verse, but Pharaoh hardened his heart. But God said, and when God told Moses, nope, I've got one last one and this is it. God knows how to soften a heart. God knows exactly what... God, God knows the heart work that needs to be done. We've got to trust Him with that. What does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh urges that they depart. He basically comes to them and says, I am begging you, please leave. I think Pharaoh gets a sudden dose of reality. He's not in charge anymore. (laughs) Right? He understands it now, though. They were to take their children and their flocks. You remember this was this is all directly opposed to. You remember the compromises that Pharaoh was trying to make. You you can I'll let you go if you go under my terms. I'll let you go if you go where I say you can go. If you if you go how I say you can go. Well, that didn't work. Another plague. Well, I'll let you go, but I'll only let. You, but you can't take any of your stuff with you. Well, that didn't work. Well, I'll let you go, but. Uh, only if you leave the women and children behind. Well, that didn't work. I'll let you go. All of these things. So Pharaoh says, no, 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 no. Leave. Leave now. Take all of your stuff. Take all of your things. All of you go. Go. 
they were urged by the Egyptians to go. The Bible here tells us that they had gained favor in the sight of the Egyptians. They, the Egyptians had kind of a soft spot for them. An, an unexplainable soft spot. I'd imagine if we rationalized it today, I mean, you know, sometimes we think, well, we can't know how that all worked out. Yeah, but human nature hasn't changed all that much either. Um, I'm sure there was, a, there was a faction among the Egyptians that kind of had a soft heart towards the Israelites. Um, that were, I, I imagine that there were some who were saying, well, you make a sacrifice for us so that we will be spared. And uh, those, those Israelites had to tell them, that's not how it works. Um, you have to be the one to do it. But if you do it, he's, as far as I know, he'll honor it. Um, you just have to do what God says to do. And so now with the death of the firstborn, which the Bible says touched in some way, touched every household, um, the Egyptians begged them to leave, urged them to leave. And now we understand why last week we learned about how God gave them these specific instructions that might seem odd. Don't sleep in your pajamas that night. Remember that one? What? Yeah. Sleep with your boots on, right? Uh, have your staff in your fall asleep with your staff in your, with your walking stick in your hand. What? Well, now we know why. Because Pharaoh wakes him up in the middle of the night and says, Get out. Get out now. Take all of your stuff and leave. Well, guess what? Israel, Israel was ready to go. Israel, Israel, because God told them to, they were ready to walk out the door already. They didn't have to take the time to get all their things packed up. They were ready to go. They didn't have to take the time to gather all of their herds. Everything was gathered. They didn't have to take the time to sort everything and to figure everything and to plan everything. They were ready to leave. I can't help but think that's why they had to hang on to this lamb for four days. What are you doing for four days? Packing. Getting ready to go. We got the cart. Pack it up. Get everything ready. I'm telling you, this is the last one. Do or die, we're leaving. We're out of here. Israel did not delay in leaving. Um, it's, it's interesting when God sent, um, when God sent Joseph down uh, and Jacob down to, um, down to Egypt. And God promised Abraham that he would prosper him no matter what. <laughs> Israel leaves Egypt with great wealth. The Egyptians' wealth. <laughs> That, humanly speaking, doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would the Egyptians bestow upon their slaves their own their wealth? It's because God put it in their heart to do it. Because God turned their heart to show favor to Israel. And, uh, and so Israel received great wealth. Then we see the departure here. Uh, the departure here in verse number 37, we already read, the children of Israel sojourn from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside the children. And, uh, and, and, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even, uh, even very much cattle. They baked unleavened cakes in the dough which they uh, brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt, and they could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victuals. Uh, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And uh, so then we see the departure here, the first stage of their journey in verse number 37. Really, they didn't, they're, they're not going really too terribly far. If you know where Egypt, uh, where the main part of Egypt is uh, around Memphis there, what is close to where Cairo is today. 
And uh, the Goshen is where the Israel lived. That was their part. That was up in the delta, uh, just south of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, and he, they took from they went from there over to toward the Sinai uh, Peninsula. And uh, um, there's a there's a spot there um, around that around that area that uh, I've seen it marked a couple different places. They don't know exactly where um, where. Succoth is uh, where it was at on the map, but it was somewhere up in the northern part of uh, just north of the Red Sea there. And, uh, and so they took this first stage of their journey. I would imagine, this is just me using my imagination, um, I would imagine it took them the, the better part of the morning to get everybody together and moved out to get that far and then have everybody just kind of settle and then establish some rank and file, right? Okay, we're all here, all right? Well, that's, you're, I mean, you're talking about moving this group in a hurry. You don't want to get too far before you, you know, because somebody's going to say, oh, oh, I forgot. Um, you watch the movie Home Alone, you know, oh, Timmy, you know, uh, whatever, whatever his name was. Um, I was like, no, I forgot something. we got to turn around and go back. He's like, well, there's no going back. But is, is everybody settled, everybody all right? We've got to figure out what the best, uh, you know, move, these, move these, uh, these folks up toward the front, the, the women, the children, the elderly up toward the front of the group. Let's, let's rearrange some things. And uh, just to kind of give them a little bit of settling, we're here, we're all in this, and we're all in this together, and we're all okay. God mentions the number. This is a tremendous, this is a great number of them. Conservative estimate uh, is around 2 million people. Um, when he says there's 600,000 that were on foot, uh, uh, six, 600,000 that were men that were on foot, this does not count uh, women, this does not count children, this does not count anyone who's not on foot, who might be riding, say, in a cart um, because of their age, because of their state that they're in. Um, and so... It, and there's there's a whole bunch of ways that they can. Some people have said it's a, it could be up to seven million people. Don't think it's quite that much. Um, but but conservatively, two to three million people. Listen, that ain't nothing. If it was one million people, that's more than that's more than a couple of barstows thrown together, <laughs> right? I mean that that's you're talking a lot of people. That's a lot of carts. That's a lot of livestock. That's a lot of people. And you gotta, you got to somehow figure out a way to communicate to all of them, we're, we're moving now, this is the direction we're going, just follow the person in front of you, here we go. This is, a, this is some kind of ride, isn't it? I mean, the, the people in the front of this group, they can't see anybody in the back. They have no idea. It's just people. It's just a line of people. Just a whole mob of people. It's just, it's huge. Um... In verse number 38, he says that there's a mixed multitude as well. Adding to the number is what, what the Scripture refers to as a mixed multitude. This is likely other slaves from other countries uh, and other nations. Um, perhaps, we're not told in Scripture who these people are, where they come from. But perhaps there's some Egyptians. I imagine that there are. There's absolutely nothing preventing anyone from just taking off with the Israelites. I imagine there were some, some Egyptians who saw the folly of continuing to follow a Pharaoh who is not mentally capable of leading a nation. You think about it. There has got to be some people in Egypt going, doesn't he get it? After the, after the water thing, then we had all the dead fish, and then we had all these frogs, and then we had a lot of dead frogs, and then we had these lice, then we had the locusts. We had all this stuff. What is he doing up there? When it came time for them to say, you know what, Israel, you guys just leave. There have got to be some Egyptians going... 
I'm with them, man. I was thinking about this this afternoon. I can't imagine. There might have been some Egyptians who tried to get in on the sacrifice that was made, the Passover. God was very specific with His instructions. You have to do it with a certain way, with certain materials. There was no halfway going here. I can imagine that there were some Egyptians going, man, I kind of want to do the blood on the door thing because I heard my slaves talking about that. So I kind of want to do the blood on the door thing. I don't want to do like the whole barbecue and have Pharaoh find out. Then, I mean, you know, that's not good. So they tried this like halfway. I'm, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it kind of in secret. Yeah, that doesn't work. That doesn't work for sure. Right? Right? But when you're looking at these instructions, we have to select a lamb on a certain day. You have to keep it for a certain number of days. You have to slate. You have to drain the blood. You have to cook it a certain way. You have to, put, you have to use a certain tool to apply the blood to a certain area. And then you have to cook the meal a certain way. And then you have to do a certain thing with the leftovers. Imagine there were some people going, oh, but I did most of it right. I got most of it. Perhaps there were some Egyptians there after their firstborn died. They sent their secondborn along with Israel and said, listen, we're toast, we're done, we're as good as dead, but you go with Israel. That's your best chance of living. That's your best chance of surviving. It's you, and you go with Israel, you follow Moses. Whatever Moses says to do, I don't know who their God is, but you go find out. Bring him back. Why do you think all of that? I think all of that because this group of this this mixed, what does he call them? Mixed multitude. They they had become a source of trouble for them. Read Numbers 11 verse 4. It says, The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? You remember, it always amazes me, it always struck me odd that Israel, after seeing God do all of this stuff in Egypt, they left out, they're in the wilderness now, and all they can think about is how great life was back in Egypt. That's because they brought some Egypt with them. Now, God did not specifically tell them not to allow anybody else to come, indicating then that this salvation is for anyone. It's for everyone. Uh, anyone who will come. But it also is an indication that there's some among God's people, God's chosen, that are not God's chosen. And in the New Testament, Jesus talks about there being tares in among the wheat. And certainly that's true in the church today. And uh, so, must, so we have to be vigilant uh, about that. <laughs> Verse 39, he tells us that they were thrust out. God had prepared them for their journey down to the last detail. Uh, you're not taking any leavened bread with you because the, the bread, the, the dough didn't even have time to rise. That's how quickly this thing all came about. Their dough didn't even have time to rise. Uh, they, they just cooked it, took it with them. They were gone, and uh, they were out of there. Verse number 40, we see the fulfillment of 430 years And there's a lot of discussion we don't have time to get into tonight uh, about how that could possibly be because of the number of generations, because of this number and that number. We're not going to get into all of that tonight. But there was, uh, in fact, Scripture here says that that it was down to the day, 430 years to the day, which means that God knew when Pharaoh would say, okay, get out. We're done. Get out now. And it was that day 
that accomplished 430 years. Now we see in verse number 41, it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now they are referred to as the host of the Lord. They were, had been bought and paid for by the Lord. This is God claiming His own and, uh, and, and naming them uh, His host, the host of the Lord. And, uh, and that we have verse number, uh, well, let's just read it. And it was a night, verse 42, it was a night to be much observed in, unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed for all the children of Israel in their generations. A night to be much observed. Like I said, it was, it, they, they had to mark this on their calendar, make it a priority. Nothing else is going to take place on this day every single year because we have something to remember. We have something to, um, to, to memorialize here. And to, to call it a celebration really is not accurate either. It's like we don't celebrate Memorial Day. N no, we observe Memorial Day. We don't have anything to... Some people treat it like a celebration anymore. But it's really not. It's not a celebration. Uh, and much, we, much like we have here, I imagine every single year there were some, uh, there were some people who remembered the friendships that they had made. Um, I mean, the Bible says they... They had gained favor with the Egyptians. There was, there was relationship there. And I imagine that there were some who knew the firstborn, who knew they were no longer with us and that they remembered that every single year and, uh, and then taught it to their children. This was not a joyous occasion. I mean, we were happy. It was a happy, sad time. We were glad because we were finally leaving, but all oh, the cost the tragedy of, of, um, of what had taken place because of Pharaoh's hard heart. Uh, verses 43 through 51, he gives them some instructions for observing the Passover. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then he shall eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Egypt of Israel shall keep it. When a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover of the Lord to all his males, uh, let all his males be circumcised, then let him come near and keep it. And uh, he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be... Uh, shall be to him that is home born and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did all the children of Israel as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass the self same day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. And uh, so we see here that there was uh, a couple of these precepts. The stranger, the hired servant and the uncircumcised were not to participate in the, uh, in the Passover. But the bought servant, the sojourning stranger who would submit to circumcision, they could eat of it. And then they were, he, he told them here, it's just in your house. They weren't to make it a big block party. They weren't to make it a big uh, progressive meal or a big feast. It was just to be observed just by them because it meant something. It was important. It was important for them to remember. And it was important. Uh, and we know. We know now what they did not. We know how important it was for their perspective future events of a coming Messiah who would be sacrificed, who would become that once and for all sacrificial lamb, the Passover, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, oh boy. How can we deny a God any part of our lives who, when we look back, had all of these things planned and prepared, ready for us to become that sacrifice for us? We're so undeserving of Him. And yet, yeah, He, he did that for us, made it available for us.
His once and for all sacrifice. Our memory verse is verse number 36. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required and they spoiled the Egyptians. God, God, God's going to take care of us and uh, it all belongs to Him anyway. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You so much for Your Word. Father, I pray that You would help us tonight as we consider these, uh, these, these very important points about what the Passover is and how it was observed. Father, I pray that You would uh, help us to see You as our once and for all sacrifice, our Passover lamb, and uh, slain and given and, and slain for us, for our benefit, for Your glory. Lord, we love you tonight, and I pray, and I thank you for each one who's here, and I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with us as we as we leave from here, and take us back to our homes safely, bring us and um, bring us back together again in our next for our next meeting. We'll give you the honor and glory for it. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen, amen. and Amen. All right, very good. I want to thank those of you joining us by way of the internet tonight, and uh, I hope it stayed on the whole time. I have no idea. Uh, but uh, I'll, be, I'll be very glad when Brother Robert is back to handle all of this. But uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm sure. We'll, uh, we'll see. So, very good. All right. God bless you. You're dismissed.